We're going to be forming a plant community, and we're going to understand how biological alchemy comes into being. But you've got to be receptive to the fungi. Um, my name's Michael Phillips. I live up in northern New Hampshire. I grow apples, and with my wife Nancy, we do medicinal herbs. And it's long ago I got interested in fungi and started understanding about mycorrhizal. I, li I like the kid too. Um, my middle initial is R, Michael R. Phillips. What do you think my middle name is? Riza? No, it's not Riza. <laughs> it's Robert. Um, that word, mycorrhiza, let's start there. The Greek roots, myco, means the fungal realm. Rhiza means the root realm. So it's, it's the union of fungus and plant. You don't have the fungus without the plant. There's dormant stages of the fungus, but you don't get all the magic unless the union is in place. And, and we'll come back to that. I mean, people are going to ask questions like, when I spread compost, do I have mycorrhizal fungi in my compost pile? What's the answer? No, you don't, because you don't have living plants with living roots in your compost pile. So as, as you start to understand the basics, it'll come together. And one of the main themes you're going to hear in this talk is all this amazing collaboration, cooperation, mutualism that comes about because two different beings come together to do more than they can do by themselves. So when I talk about mycorrhizal fungi, I'm talking about a small portion of the soil food web. So here it's, as you all know, the acidomycetes and the sapotrophic fungi and the bacteria that break down organic matter. Mycorrhizal fungi tap into that release, that mi mineralization of nutrients. And below there are the predators, the protozoa, the nematodes, and microbe eats microbe, and that's basically how nutrients get freed up for plants to take them up in a direct form. And when I think about the soil food web, besides just being mind blown away, it's, this is my team, and this is kind of arrogant to say this, but I'm the captain of this team at my farm. And by that, I mean I have one really simple job as captain. It's not to screw up my team. And once you start thinking from that perspective, how can I work with this, abet this, build this, but not screw it up? Your farming, your gardening is going to start to become a whole lot more successful. This is the picture of what is called an arbuscule. And this is the nutrient transfer mechanism of a certain type of mycorrhizal fungi that actually penetrates into the cell of the root. So this is where carbon sugars from the plant are provided to the fungi, and the fungus in turn provides minerals and partially built nutrition to the plant. So let's just step back a minute and look at that. Some of you might be thinking, that, that looks a lot like a tree. Or maybe you're thinking, that looks a lot like the feeder root system of a plant. If you've been trained medically, you might be thinking, that looks a lot how the alveoli in my lungs work, the, the bronchial system where oxygen gets exchanged. In Herbalism is this long-standing tradition called doctrine of signatures. And the doctrine of signatures is basically you, you look at a plant, you sense its energetics, and, and something about it suggests that lung wart might have some value to the lungs. I'm picking a really obvious one. But when I look at this and think about tree, feeder root system, oxygen being exchanged in my blood, it's like a direct connection to life itself. And, and this whole fungal plant union is really one of several really important collaborations that why we're here, why there's life on this planet. So mycorrhizae uh, tap into plant health in many different ways. Just their presence, just like a good healthy bacterial presence on the root zone, claims that niche. So root pathogens, soil diseases are not going to get in there to the same extent. I'm going to teach you how the nutrient reach of a plant gets increased radically through the action of the mycorrhizal fungi. Everything that John Kemp teaches about healthy plant metabolism from photosynthesis efficiency to protein synthesis 
That's driven by minerals, and mycorrhizal fungi are bringing those minerals to the plant. Uh, fungi are the means by which a plant community sends signals, warnings, telling each other, prepare for this. Fungi are also involved with tickling the systemic resistance response that's in plants. You know, and you don't have to know any of this. You just have to know that, oh, I want to get fungal. Remember our toes, we're wiggling here. Um, and, and when you start to think about weaving all those pieces together, I mean, this is the basis of resiliency in an ecosystem. You know, how are we going to deal with a warming climate with higher drought periods and more rain? Well, the fungi mediate that. That's what that word resilience means. And then we'll also look at one more little thing. Mycorrhizal fungi, particularly endomycorrhizal fungi, are the main means by which carbon gets sequestered in the soil. That's a pretty amazing gift. So let, let's establish planetary norms here to get started. Approximately 95% of the plants on this planet have or want this affiliation with mycorrhizal fungi. So there's, there's some garden plants, the uh, beet family chard, all the brassicas that don't form this affiliation. Buckwheat is thought not to form this affiliation. But even those plants, if you went back in time, started with it. They lost it. There's a lot of things in flux here. You know, another group of plants that don't readily form this affiliation are the more newer hybrid seeds that have been developed because they've been created basically in a, a different kind of fertilization scenario and the fungi connection was overlooked. We've actually bred like dumber plants because they don't have that union with the fungi. But this notion that this is the normal way that plants get nutrients began approximately 400, 450 million years ago. Ours was an oceanic planet. And when the oceans receded, left behind in the tidal pools were algae-like plants, which were basically the ancestors of what would become known as vascular plants. But they didn't have a root system. And those same tidal pools were oceanic fungi. And fungi formed this through their hyphae, mycelium. And basically a surrogate root deal was struck between plants, vascular plants, and fungi. And this is carried forward till today. And it's again, the normal way. So that's my main point in this slide. This is the normal way that plants get nutrients. Now let's learn a little bit about types because we have to have a little bit of knowledge so we can really take this far. Um, the, the two major types of mycorrhizal fungi, ecto, E-C-T-O, ecto basically cover the outside of the root, they penetrate into intracellular spaces, um, but they don't actually go in that root cell like that picture I showed earlier. And ecto are primarily affiliated with the trees of the forest. The trait that I want to point out right now is Ectomycorrhizae have hyphae, we call them explorer hyphae, that can reach as much as 12 feet beyond the root zone. Now the other type is endo, E-N-D-O, and that means go within. This is the type that forms those arbuscules. And endomycorrhizae don't reach as far, but their thing is to really create much more immediate nutrient reach through the density of the mycelium around it. So we got those two kind of baselines to start, ecto and endo. This is a picture of a colonized root of a tree. And ectomycorrhizae, it, it's basically like the way fingers fit into a glove. It just totally sheaths them. And we can actually go into the forest and dig up fine roots of trees, and you can see these fungi, um, which was kind of the beginning point for how we started to realize there was something going on between fungus and roots. Um, trees make up like 3% of the plant species on the planet, but there's a lot of trees out there. Um, so ectomycorrhizae play a big role. Me ectomycorrhizae sexually reproduce. So there's tens of thousands of species and, and sexually reproducing if you're a fungi means that you have some kind of fruiting body. And in the case of Ectomycorrhizae, 
Some of you know these fruiting bodies. You know them as chanterelles or bolites or matsusakis. Um, they're all affiliated with tree roots. You go to the forest to find those fungi. And I'm, I'm going to get into this whole idea of those long distance explorer hyphae and what they can do in terms of extracting minerals from rock. My arm is now a feeder root. So it's pretty minute. Our eyes can see feeder roots, but not all that much. And if I'm on my own some, I can get nutrients from basically maybe within a half inch or so where the groundwater, the capillary action brings nutrients to me. And yes, bacteria are in that zone and they're consuming each other and that's releasing nutrients. But my reach as a bare root, a plant on my own, is not that far. So you can kind of easily see that once I've gotten the nutrients that have been delivered, if I don't keep extending into the soil, I'm basically in a nutrient depletion zone. When you have fungi colonizing this root, that zone where nutrients can be sucked out of by the mycelium is on the order of more like four or five, six inches beyond the root. So, so that's a big increase of the area that I can reach just as an individual root. That's one fungus with one plant. Now, humans, the first person to recognize that there was a symbiotic relationship, a good relationship going on between fungi and roots was a Polish botanist. And that was in the year 1881. And this is a time, you know, we're coming out of the Civil War. World War I is coming. During the time of World War I would be the Spanish flu and 50 million people would die. And people had no idea where that came from. We couldn't see viruses, we couldn't see bacteria. And the, the notion of germs causing disease was really hard to break from thinking about fungi not being a problem for trees. So we're in that mindset, hold that mindset. Around 1900, we have microscopes and people can actually draw those arbuscules that are in the cell. So, so now we're actually seeing the invisible realm as well as what's on the outside of the root. In 1924, Rudolf Steiner delivers agricultural lectures in Austria, and he makes this statement. This, this was, um, he's describing how a tree works and how the tree is an extension of the bark, an extension of the soil through the bark, that there's something more soil-like about the form of a tree than this down below. I don't want to go too deep into biodynamics, so I'll just, that's what I'll do for the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> but in, in that, he, he talked about this mesh of roots. He talked about how you needed to keep some of the woodlands, some of the hedges, some of the pastures, and, and hold on to the thought, we mostly think germs are a problem. And he said, a common root being forms that helps plants in that part of the farm connect to plants in this part, that sharing takes place. This is incredibly perceptive. Today, scientists call it the common mycorrhizal network. And so when I, when I talked about one root with that reach, now I'm talking about plants sharing multiple affiliations with different fungi. Some of those are ecto, which reach further. Some of those are endo. And plant diversity creates an opportunity for greater and greater fungal diversity in the soil. And that common mycorrhizal network, what Steiner called the common root being, is really where the magic starts to happen. So now we've got this concept of fungus and root. Now I'm introducing lots of plant diversity is important here too. And we're gonna, we're gonna see how some of that works. So this is a, a picture of my orchard. I have a degree in civil engineering. I could have laid these trees out in a straight line. I didn't feel compelled about that. But you also don't just see apple trees growing on bare ground, an herbicide strip with some grass in between. There are all kinds of plants out there. It's, it's a real polyculture. And the diversity that you see above reflects the diversity below that's much greater if it was that more narrow 
idea of an orchard. In any healthy ecosystem, we're, we're going to go back down to your toes right now. Imagine the amount of soil underneath your foot. In that soil, and I'm, it's mostly in the top six inches, but it goes deeper. In that amount of soil beneath your foot are approximately 300 miles of fungal hyphae. You know, when I'm home in northern New Hampshire, if I could stretch out those 300 interlaced miles, it'd be long enough for me to, to walk a gossamer highway up to Montreal and back. And that's under each single foot in a healthy, and there I want to emphasize the next word, diverse ecosystem. So it's a pretty amazing realm that we're talking about. So going back to 1881, Steiner, we get over the germ theory thing. The 1950s, research has started on understanding what's going on in the forest in terms of ectomycorrhizae. 1970s, people start looking at endo, the type that go into the cell. And it's only in the 90s, this last decade or so, that we started looking at ecosystem connections. We started looking at how do nutrients move? You know, how are these, quote, decisions made? And, and as we open the scientific door, I want us all to understand we're, we're really basically still in kindergarten. What there is to know, we know a very, very little piece. So here, here's a trial where red clover is inoculated with three different species of fungi, and they use compartmentalized chambers, and, and they're trying to see a, one of the gifts of mycorrhizal fungi is, is bringing phosphorus to plants. And they're trying to see why does the plant decide to give its plant sugars to this fungus versus that fungus. And they come up with some conclusions. But it, again, it's, it's a very reductionist view. It's one plant. It's not a plant community. It's a lot like what I'm about to do. I do with apologize, apologies to fungi everywhere. It's a lot like this, an errant fungus comes on the scene and knocks on the plant root. I have got the greatest fungus. No one has ever had greater, uh, greater phosphorus than me. You really are going to want my phosphorus. No one has anything like this. It's the best, the absolute best. And it doesn't work like that, luckily. Um, there is no like one fungus to rule them all. Um, that was Trump. I'm trying to do a thing with Trump. <laughs> It works more like this. At certain points in the growing season, depending on the plant, as much as two-thirds of the photosynthates, those carbon sugars that are produced through plant metabolism, are directed to the root zone to be traded with the biology. And the decision, quote, the intelligence behind that, we don't know if it's plant-driven or fungal-driven, but let's, this is where we're going to form a plant community. So let's say here, we have some plants that are growing pretty tall in the canopy. You're, you're up there in the sunshine. You're, you're really photosynthesizing well. And so from that point of view, you're rather well off. You're wealthy. You've got more photosynthetes than you need necessarily for your own growth. And the fungi look at that and say, well, you're wealthy. You should pay more. You, we're not going to give you a deal because you have the most wealth. We're going to say, we need to share this. And over here, maybe you're more in the shade. Or, or maybe this is the drier part of the land and, and water isn't moving as much over here. Or back there, you're just, you got zinc issues, like you in the back. You really have some <laughs> zinc issues. Um, <laughs> the fungal community knows to redirect where things are needed. This is where collaboration comes into play. And some of you as plants are what I call passage plants. And, and that works like this. Endomycorrhizae A is tapped into your protoplasm. It brings nutrients. Endomycorrhizae B moves to another plant, but it can take nutrients out of your protoplasm. And this is how things move around in that plant community. The whole common mycorrhizal network works a lot like a social democracy. This is Bernie Sanders would love this. You know, this is, is what is going on here. The endomycorrhizal realm, we can't see. And yet, and I think this is important, um, 
we have to let our imagination, our intuition tap into this. So the better we can understand it, the better we're going to do above ground as the captain of the team whose only job is not to screw things up. So endomycorrhizae um, form those arbuscules. This is an invisible realm. Some 250,000 species of plants are affiliated with approximately 300 species of endomycorrhizal fungi. Endomycorrhizae reproduce clonally. They don't have mushrooms. They have other ways of forming spores, but there's no mushroom above the ground. There's no truffle. There's no puffball. And because they reproduce clonally, there's not tens of thousands of species. And yet, the same species of endomycorrhizae can be found in the tropics, as in the subtropical, as in the savanna, as in the temporal forest, as in the boreal forest. They're very cosmopolitan. They know how to get around, work with different plants. Um, that genetic continuity, we'll talk in a minute about how skill sets are increased, but that constancy, it's really something to marvel about when you think 450 million years and you could have evolved and become this or that or this, and yet you stayed the course because nature nailed it from the beginning. Uh, and I just described passage plants. And, and you know, here we are at the bionutrient conference and the, the topic of nutrient density comes up again and again. How incredible to have a common root being helping redirect nutrients in a balanced form so everyone's getting more of what they need. So really the key, as much as we'll talk about mineral amendments and I'll talk tomorrow about foliar sprays, the key is the fungi and, and making a fungal ecosystem that works down below. So one of the ways that the fungal network passes messages, um, well, two ways basically, there's phytochemical signals and there's also electrical impulses. And here's just a, Clint Eastwood has nothing to do with it. Here's a, just one example of it. This plant is being attacked by aphids. Aphids have just come onto the scene for whatever reason, whatever nutrients missing, aphids are there. And that plant responds internally to change its phytochemistry to the degree it can to make that plant less interesting to aphids. And that phytochemical signal goes out and over here and here and here and here, these plants are picking up that message. What those plants do in response is not so much beef up for aphids, but send out volatiles calling beneficial insects who will eat aphids to come on the scene before the aphids actually arrive. And, and so that's how the community as a whole, one example, is working to protect itself. The whole idea of soil carbon. So this is a endomycorrhizal gift. During the growing season, depending on what you're growing, um, there's different phases of root growth. Like with fruit trees, there's a spring feed a root flush and a fall feed a root flush. And when roots extend to gather up nutrients for certain purposes, um, the mycorrhizal fungi follow. And when the roots retract, and annuals, that's gonna happen at the end of the growing season, but it, it can be defined in different ways for different plants, the mycorrhizal fungi also retract. But they leave behind a protein-like substance called lamellin. Lamellin consists of 30 to 40% carbon. That's one of the means by which endomycorrhizae are putting carbon in the soil. Another thing that endomycorrhizae do is they are basically the former, they form these gated communities that we know as soil aggregates. So when sand, silt, and clay and organic matter are bound together, the glue that holds them together is the lamellin. I call it a gated community because this is where the fungi and bacteria can go, but it's a small enough space within to be safe from protozoa and nematodes that would consume them. So it's, it's in the interest of the fungi to create these soil aggregates. It's like a safe place to be. Um, we as growers think about soil aggregates from the perspective of good tilth. So in biological farming, we talk about green carbon. That's basically cover crops. 
using surface decomposition. Talk about brown carbon, very simple version of that is compost. Black carbon, for me, in the orchard is decaying um, raw meal wood chips. Um, biochar is another great example of black carbon. But, but all of this is about working with mycorrhizal fungi as you start to understand it to form gated communities, to form that good tilth, which as any of you as, as growers who've worked the same land for 10, 20 years, you know how it improves. You like to think you did some things right, but just keep in mind it was the fungi that did it. That good tilth is soil aggregation at work. So fungi carry forward into the future, expand their territory, one by simply the mycelium expanding, finding plants that they associate with and bringing them into the fold. Another is that fungi overwinter in roots after an annual has done its thing. Um, the relevance of that is if, if you're in the habit of totally pulling up the beans and the peas in your gardens or the tomato plants, you want to learn to snip them off because the fungi are going to carry forward in those root fragments left in the soil. And then endomycorrhizae do form spores, sometimes in the roots, sometimes out there in the mass of the mycelium. And it's those spores that give us a chance to work a little more intentionally in terms of restoring fungal connection to soil. So this is a poisonous pigskin puffball. This is an ectomycorrhizal fruiting body. Um, when that puffball is ready to puff, it sends out tens of thousands of spores, which get disseminated on the wind. So ectomycorrhizae actually have a good way of getting out there figured out. They can be out in the light, and they have little tufts on the spore casing that help them be carried by the wind. So if, if there's a forest fire and, and the soil gets superheated, ectomycorrhizae move back fairly quick. <laughs> Endomycorrhizae don't have that ability to be out in sunlight. They're very smooth, the spores, and they accordingly, um, they get around by in the gut of a worm or on the back of a vole. They don't move that fast. Um, 1980, Mount St. Helens blew up out in Oregon, Washington, volcanic eruption. And some 230 square miles was impacted. The plant life was destroyed. The soil life was destroyed. In that kind of lateral explosion, temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit is what did in the plants and the microbes. And it would take 20 years before the full fungal diversity, and thus the plant diversity, got restored to those lands, because that's how slowly endo can work. So the, the tree aspect came back, because ecto blows in. But I'm, I'm just emphasizing this slowness, because when we start talking about highly degraded soils, uh, highly compacted soils, over-tilled soils, soils that have been abused by herbicides and insecticides and fungicides, um, we have a lot of those, a lot of soils in that category. And there are occasions where it makes a lot of sense to jumpstart what we'd otherwise be waiting for the worms and the voles to do. And this is where com commercial inoculum comes into play. And when I talk about commercial inoculum, um, they are gathering the spores of specific varieties, and, and I'm going to define what I mean by a quality inoculum. The cost is, is rather insignificant. Um, a three-pound jar of the endomycorrhizal mix that I get from bioorganics costs on the order of like $75, and, and that's enough for something like 3,000 fruit trees or tomato plants and etc. And I'm going to get into examples of what I would do. You can get dry powder formulations, which works well in potting soil or in a, a garden furrow. You can get liquid formulations if you're doing row crops on a much bigger scale and you're planting with a seed drill. Um, you can actually, if you just planted three fruit trees, you don't need the three pound jar, and, and there are smaller amounts. 
you can go to a healthy ecosystem, ask permission of the plant spirits, and take some... Now, if, if you planted spruce trees, you'd want to go to a healthy forest ecosystem. You have to have some understanding of this. But you can bring that inoculum back, move aside an inch or so of, of the mulchy layer where feeder roots of the plant you're growing are found, and you're going to introduce some indigenous species. So there's many different ways. You can, you can grow mycorrhizal fungi in sacks with grasses. So something like annual ryegrass or Baha'i grass, and the Rodale Institute has this posted on their website. Uh, grasses have multiple affiliations, as much as 50 different species they're known to link up with. And if you grow it in a sack and the grass either frost kills or goes dormant because water is cut off, four or so months later, there's going to be 100 million spores in that volume of soil in the sack. So there, there's some things you need to know about how you go about that, but, but there's ways to do it homegrown as well. So one of the things about in that healthy ecosystem I keep talking to about is typically there'll be 20 to as much as many as 50 different species of fungi working in that a small area, extended and extended and extended. And so diversity is really important. And th this is actually an example of that picture. When I'm doing a lot of fruit tree planting, I, I buy the mycorrhizal inoculum with a um, hydrogel. And it's just because it's fun, especially when I'm doing a kind of a planting party, because you dip the root system in and you can see the gel on the roots. And it's like, yeah, that's the fungi. It's not the fungi. We can't see it. But I can briefly pretend <laughs> that that's what's going on. So with those 20 or 50 different species, you have some fungi that are really good in getting a start in a cold spring soil. You have other fungi that are especially adept at helping a perennial system get established, but in the long run, their job might be done and they might move on. Some fungi are going to be the ones that are really good at snagging magnesium or calcium or phosphorus. Um, they have different jobs that they do. So again, the, the goal here is the more the merrier. Um, this is a picture of endomycorrhizal spores, Gigaspora margarita. Um, that's basically how, for the last several decades, we've identified the species of fungi in the soil. Uh, DNA testing is now possible. But you really don't have to know the names of your fungi. You just have to know that lots of plant diversity, bring it on, more fungal diversity. And when you're purchasing inoculum, let's take that tenant a little further. There are some mycorrhizal um, products that have just one species. Um, at the core, you'll find a selection of, of four different species. And I'm going to look at what those four do specifically. And the products that I've been buying from uh, Bioorganics in Pennsylvania or Mycorrhizal Applications, which is out in Oregon, um, some of their products contain as many as nine different endotypes. So that's what I go for, because the more diversity, the better. Um, so these four, let's look at them. Dlomus interradices has very, very small spores. Sporulation happens within the roots, and it can be kind of brought into this sporulation stage by more industrial methods. So it's, it's very common that those one species products have this one fungus. Now, it's a good fungus, and it's an important fungus. But you might use it on a golf course fairway. You might use it in the greenhouse. But you're not going to get that plant community. You're not going to get that diversity thing going. On the other hand, the products that feature this one fungus will tell you that they have spore counts six times as high as the other products. Well, why is that? Because these are the tiniest, tiniest spores. The one I just showed you, um, the white ones, Gigaspora marguerite, are the largest spores. And we can't see any of it. But, but that's the whole thing about spore counts. That, that's not the real story. Diversity is more of what's going on. There are three species of endomycorrhizae, um, Desert Cola, Fastaculum, and 
mase that are particularly noted for moving water around throughout a plant community. So mase is included in those core four, um, but in, in the nine version product I get, there's usually one or the other of these other two as well. And these are really important fungi in terms of like, think about desertification. There's no longer plants, there's no longer fungi. To bring back those ecosystems, it's not just about putting plants out there <laughs> to deal with drought, it's about establishing fungal connections as well. So it's, it's important to understand and get these fungi back at work. Another one, uh, Glomus aggregatum, uh, has all kinds of skills. This is why these were selected as, as like the best ballpark players. Um, just the fact that you can function in nutrient porous sandy soils really is gonna give you a big leg up if that's what you're working with, lighter soils. But it also improves aeration and more compacted clay soils. So it has different skill sets. Uh, fungi are gonna be involved with decreasing salinity, dealing with heavy metal issues. Um, again, we, we kind of know some indications of skill sets, that's in the handout, but that's not the whole story. And, and this notion that I'm gonna grow this variety of wheat, or I'm growing this kind of eggplant, what's the one fungal species I should get for that? Stop that. <laughs> We're a community. We're gonna farm as a community. We're gonna garden as a community. It's through diversity, we have more fungal diversity. Um, aggregatum has a role in uh, rapidly colonizing seedlings. So that's an advantage if, if that's what you're working with, a greenhouse setting. You know, interradices kicks in, but not as quickly as aggregatum. And then when you go to transplant, that word resilience is really helpful to know. My roots already have this fungal connection. They're gonna get going. The plant friend that is my team player is gonna have the necessary friend. Another one is etunicatum. Now, recent trials have revealed how the presence of etunicatum on the roots of herbs that are grown for their volatile oils, so I'm talking about things like sacred basil or the mint family, many different herbs. Um, levels of those volatiles are increased by association with the tunicatum. Um, and that's why we're growing those herbs, usually, that's the medicine. Now this is interesting, you know, so as a grower, we make different choices. And sometimes we make choices that are, we think for the plant, maybe we think it's for the soil life, but often it's for us. It's like our idea of, I don't wanna see weeds and I don't wanna fight it. So here, I'm talking about black plastic mulch. So that has a place, but let, let's look at it from down below, the fungal perspective. Under a black plastic mulch, soil, particularly when it's an impermeable type of black plastic, not a landscape cloth, um, that doesn't let water through, it doesn't let air through. Fungi need water and air. Bacteria, on the other hand, are gonna, certain bacteria can thrive under that ecosystem. So if, if that mulch is down for a month or two and you're trying to kill, let's say, quackgrass roots, the ones with the rhizomes, um, that's okay. But when that mulch is now down for a whole growing season, or especially if it's down for two or three years, depending on the crop, some of these herbs will overwinter, um, that choice, I don't want to fight weeds, and so I'm using the mulch, leads to a non-fungal place, and the very fungi that could make your medicine more powerful is no longer involved. So that's the way to start thinking about how do I do what I do biologically? It's, it's not always our point of view. Another thing that's amazing about fungi is they have an incredible adaptability. So earlier I mentioned how some fungi like chard, the brassicas, have lost this mycorrhizal connection. Well, recently someone was studying mustard in a particular ecosystem connection. Mustard's a brassica. It shouldn't have a mycorrhizal connection, but that mustard plant in Spain really needed phosphorus. And mycorrhizal fungi are what deliver And so it said, yep, I'm back in the game. And it formed that affiliation. So when you read about non-mycorrhizal plants and this or that, it's none of it's a rule of stone. Um, whatever that word. <laughs> um, we're still in kindergarten. Now another thing mycorrhizal fungi do, 
I talked about passage plants. We formed this mycelium. If you are, have an affiliation with one particular type of endomycorrhizae, and over here that same, another plant has that same affiliation, and different fungi got starts on you, the same species can fuse together. This is called anastomosis. This is like grafting. You know, I'm a fruit grower. I understand grafting. So fungi, the same species can do it. And now they start to find, form more direct pipelines to make this nutrient sharing a little richer. Um, it gets really, really cool as you start to, to look at all this. Now blueberries, acid-loving plants, have an affiliation with a third type of mycorrhizae. This is the Ericaceae mycorrhizae. This is an inoculum that is not, now and then I hear of fledging efforts, but it's not easy to, to create a com commercial inoculum of. However, two ways of going about it. Here in New England, low bush blueberries grow. Going there and, and doing the wild soil thing is, is one way to bring it back. But it also turns out that approximately nine out of 11 samples of peat moss will have spores of Ericaceae mycorrhizae because they come from the boreal ecosystem where acid-loving plants were growing and those spores last a long time. So often your high bush blueberries are gonna have this affiliation, you didn't realize it, but if, if you're having a issue with growing blueberries, Think about getting some of the right kind of mycorrhizae in there, and those are two means that you might do that by. So this, ice, this notion of support networks as a way to proceed in life. We've, we've formed a plant community. I called it a social democracy, and I know I'm anthropomorphizing um, when I do that. Um, but it really is what the biology teaches again and again. There's something to be had from friends, from connection. Back in Rachel Carson's time, there was an ecologist named Frank Egler. And Frank Egler said, nature is not more complicated than we think. Nature is more complicated than we can think. I like that. I'm a humble captain. I, I don't need to know everything, but I just know it's awesome. Let's very quickly look at the plant side of this. So if you went to John Kemp's workshop yesterday, you heard some of this, but the, the healthy plant metabolism starts with photosynthesis and you go on there to combine those plant sugars, simple sugars, they complex, they form polysaccharides, they combine with nitrogen, that's the basis of protein synthesis. And if this is a robust process, you get more <coughs> lipid production at the end and at the very end, in response to environmental reality and other signals, plants form what are called secondary plant metabolites. I like to use the word resistance metabolites, but that's basically the immune function of the plant. And at its, at its heart, um, it begins with photosynthesis, and photosynthesis can be sluggish or robust, and it's really about the availability of a wide array of trace minerals. And if those trace minerals are there, they act as enzyme cofactors in these different metabolic steps to just make the process go faster. That's a very quick overview of what's going on there. So those trace minerals, they might come from putting azomite clay in your compost pile. They might come from a foliar spray. They might come because you got a great connection to get a pickup truck load of rock dust and you put that over your gardens or your fields. There's, there's ways to import it. But there are players involved down below that are also bringing those minerals. And now we're back to the fungi. When a fungal hyphae explores into new ground, one of the things that happens is, is bacteria move along with it. And the fungal hyphae, through its tip, exudes some carbon sugars to feed those bacteria back along the length of the hyphae. And the bacteria, in turn, produce organic acids that can dissolve things like rock phosphate, which is in the soil. But if we're talking about fungal tips that are on the ends of those explorer hyphae that go 12 feet, or if a root system is getting down to where bedrock is, to where ledge is, 
those fungal tips with those bacterial companions <coughs> form what I called a bacterial bore. And, and we're just talking micrometers a year, but they literally bore into bedrock through the collaboration of the bacteria and the fungi to dissolve minerals, which that fungal tip then brings back to the plant. Now, I had a very simple drawing done for my new book, Mycorrhizal Planet, to show this, because it turns out that in reality, the fungi are kind of naughty when you, now, do I have to tell you what I'm talking about now? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but this is how it works, and it's just like, well, that's cool. There's this collaboration between bacteria and fungi. Now, let's, let's take the collaboration to another place. I've spoken about trees having an affiliation with ectomycorrhizae. They have the 12-foot hyphae. I mentioned how 250,000 species of plants have the affiliation with endo. They don't have that long distance aspect. But in between, and remember, this is a very adaptable world, are plants that have an affiliation with both ecto and endo systems. These are what are known as the so-called soft hardwoods. So I'm talking now about things like willow and alder, soft maple. Um, there could be many, many other species, but it's, it's more like shrub trees. They, they don't, I mean, there are big alders, but a lot of what I'm talking about is more of a shrub tree type um, planting. Because they have that affiliation with both systems, they have hyphae with the bacterial bore aspect, remineralizing the soil from bedrock. <clears throat> that nutrient is brought into the protoplasm of that plant, that bridge tree, and it in turn can be piped out through an endosystem to other plants that would otherwise never get that connection with the bedrock. So how do you use that? Just think like polyculture. Where I have planted my fruit trees, there are willows and alders aplenty. And they might be 150, 200 feet out beyond where my apple trees are. That's okay, because there's passage plants in between. This is what I mean about, think about your whole ecosystem as a community. There's many connections that are happening in different ways. Okay, this, this is a good question. I'm talking about fruit trees, there's that word trees. For some reason, it's mostly thought that fruit trees and berries, any woodsy perennial that fruits, does not affiliate with ecto at all. And so it has the endo affiliation. So, so my idea of bridge trees, polyculture that includes these kind of species, makes that connection possible. But in the same breath, there have been random studies here or there, and someone has an old pear tree, or a cherry tree, or an apple tree, and they say, this does have an ecto-affiliation. I just want to emphasize that we humans think we've got a few rules down, but it shifts. The fungi can do amazing things. Mostly, if you're planting fruit trees, you want to get endomycorrhizal inoculum. If you're planting Christmas trees, you want an ecto-type. But, but there's this middle ground where things can really be surprisingly different. Plants go on to protein synthesis. So the, the same idea, trace minerals are necessary so that this process can be facilitated. But this is where the carbon is now bonded with nitrogen. So that there's some choices to be made where that nitrogen comes from. But, but the basic idea of protein synthesis is first amino acids are formed. Those amino acids combine to form incomplete proteins, which are known as peptides. And ideally, they form complete proteins. That's what good healthy plant metabolism, that's our goal. And we're going to look at why that is. Um, the nitrogen piece. When a protozoa eats a bacteria or a fungi, one of its waste products is nitrogen in the form of ammonium. And plants work with nitrogen in the ammonium form. When you are working with a more bacterial dominated root zone, um, there will be nitrifying bacteria there that convert that ammonium to nitrate. 
and then the plant has to convert the nitrate back to ammonium to use it. Now that all happens, that doesn't seem really relevant, but if the plant can get that ammonium directly and not have to convert it back, it has more energy to go further on the metabolic pathway. And it turns out that in a fungal dominated ecosystem, 300 miles beneath your foot, the root zone is slightly more acidic and nitrifying bacteria don't like that. So this is just a quick little plunge into what's going on down there in terms of getting nitrogen in the right form. So the relevance of this looks like this. Insects with simple digestive systems, those that feed on foliage from aphids to caterpillars, cannot digest complete proteins. Many of the fungal spotting diseases get their foothold by feeding on amino acids in the sap. So the more protein synthesis is completed, the less amino acids are available for the disease and to draw those insects in. So this is the basis of a healthy plant, you know, going through the whole metabolic, metabolic pathway. But that's what's going on. And our goal is to see, so here's a cell, any plant cell. It has a cell wall. <clears throat> right inside that cell wall is protoplasm. And inside that is a cell membrane. The cell membrane is made up of, of phospholipids, which do not allow just any nutrient to pass through. So complete proteins get embedded in that cell membrane. Some of those proteins have a, an opening where sugars can be sent in. And, and anything that's sent into the heart of the cell, the cytoplasm, that's not available for those simple insects and diseases to get a hold of. So the cell membrane is an amazing ad adaptation of how all this metabolic results are being processed and stored. Now, I always found it really cool when you, you see a beneficial pattern in nature, how it's repeated. Think of our planet now. Think of the top several inches of soil where the fungi live, where the soil food web is at its richest and most diverse. And, and that's like a cell membrane. That's what's protecting life on this planet. And it's just, that pattern was repeated within the cell, within the plant. Um, the fungi are part of that. We go beyond protein to fats. So fatty acids become lipids. Lipids are stored in seed, they're stored in stems, they're stored in, stored in leaf cells. Um, this is one way that the plant sets aside some energy so when it's a more rainy period and disease comes stronger on the scene, it has fats to break down to prevent having to go back to the proteins and break them down, which would cause this cascade of amino acids back in the sap, and, and so the problem gets worse. So that's pretty amazing. And I really zoned in on that when I started growing holistically. So in my, my holistic spray mix, there are seed oils like neem and karanja. Uh, there's liquid fish, which has fatty acids. I'm just fueling that dynamic. This, this picture is the uh, waxy cuticle on the surface of an apple leaf. When you look at pictures of cuticles on different types of plants, it's like snowflakes. They all have like a different crystalline pattern. I'm going to get into that aspect a little bit more tomorrow. Um, but fatty acids are really important, both within, but how I grow to deal with disease pressures. If all that goes along really robustly, you have plants that are producing more terpenoids and flavonoids and alkaloids. And you know, this is what herbal, herbalists love, because this is like medicine for people. But it, it begins as the immune function of the plant. Plants don't have red blood cells. They have phytochemistry. And there's this amazing storyline that goes on with this um, in terms of disease winning <coughs> or plant not succumbing to that disease and how we can build resistance in plants. One of the aspects of healthy plant metabolism, just as I said with nitrogen in terms of saving energy, is, is understanding how the microbes in the rhizosphere basically act like the rumen of a cow. When microbe eats microbe and releases nutrients, it's releasing, releasing bacterial metabolites in a little bit more nutrient-dense form than a simple soluble ion. And that, in turn, gives the plant more reserve energy to do all this good stuff. Now, mycorrhizal fungi 
endomycorrhiza fungi take this a step further. Those arbuscules that form in the cell of the root <coughs> live on the order of three to seven days. And then the pipeline gets shut off and that arbuscule dissolves into the plant sap. And it dissolves in such a way that complex shell wall proteins, um, polysaccharides, lipid compounds are being delivered directly to the plant. This is as good as it gets. This is like free range eggs and bodybuilder shakes. And it's the mycorrhizal fungi that are like contributing that nutrient dense approach. And many of these incredible things happen from there. I'm not so sure about the CO2 part. I, I bet there was a CO2 part when it was active, but I don't know about once it's starting to be given up. So I often tell people in a, a full day orchard workshop, I can tell you words like terpenoids or induced systemic resistance. Um, but what's important is just let it in and let it out, but come out with fungal dominance in the soil, mineralization, these are the keys to unlocking healthy plant metabolism. So when we look at fungal groupings, um, we've been talking about the mycorrhizal fungi. It's really a small corner of the kingdom. Sapotrophic fungi, um, this is what Mark Jones does so well, but these are the fungi that break down organic matter and a whole bunch more mushrooms come on the scene that we're interested in. Then there are the fungi that live <coughs> both on the surface of the plant and within the leaf and stem structure above. I'm going to be talking about those tomorrow. So this is the epiphytic and the endophytic fungi. Um, <clears throat> also the yeasts that are just occupying a lot of that surface niche. And then finally at the bottom, another small kingdom are the fungi, the parasitic and pathogenic fungi that cause diseases. Now just think about humans in the last hundred years. And we've been given these tools that kill fungi. And so when we spray fungicides to deal with a disease on a food crop, it drips to the soil, it covers the branches and the leafes because that's where the pathogens come in, but it also impacts all those other fungi. And we've been talking about all the amazing things that those other fungi do, and we kick them out the door to have this idea of, of medicine solving the disease problem, and we just made things worse and worse and worse. Now th this picture, I'm not gonna go so much into the types of diseases here, but this picture is really cool. It shows the spores of a disease on apple called cedar apple rust, which comes from the red cedar trees. It's a fungus and it sends out a hyphae and that hyphae has to punch its way into the leaf surface and the plant has defenses against that. But this is a fungus that learned when I land on the underside where the stomates are, I can send my hyphae right through that stomate to get into the plant. And again, it's, these microscopic pictures are amazing because you can like start to see this. So all the idea of immune function goes out the door. Phytochemistry is not the way to stop cedar apple rust. This is where competitive colonization comes in. And when there is a, some spots have occurred on the apple on this branch in this corner of the orchard, that's scab. But the signals that go out throughout the community are gonna be in the plant and in turn gonna be one aspect of preparing, being ready for what comes. The other part is known as induced systemic resistance. This evokes the jasmonic acid and ethylene pathways. And the relevance here is that things that land on the surface of the plant can kindle this reaction, but there's also something going on down below that kindles this reaction. So different inducing elicitors include things like microbes. Um, compost tea, effective microorganisms are in this category. It includes nutrients. When you spray an extract of kelp, whether it's a liquid cold process kelp or seaweed extract, that's going to stimulate this response. When you work with different herbal remedies, which I'm going to explore tomorrow, um, you're stimulating that response. And that's the human side. That's the applied through a sprayer 
way that we can stimulate plant health, stimulate that disease resistance. But down in the soil, when mycorrhizal fungi made that deal to penetrate into root cells, the plant defensive mechanisms had to shut down. And they still exist, but they just don't try to fight the mycorrhizal fungi, but they send induced systemic response throughout the rest of the plant. So again, mycorrhizal fungi, now we're tying them directly to disease resistance in plants. Steiner again, everything in nature is independent. I have to emphasize this again and again. You know, we're weaving this incredible tapestry, you know, the fungal mycelium, you can, your toes, you can feel that now. It's like all these things, all these aspects are coming together. In the new book, I defined this idea of the non-disturbance principle. And it begins with the, the notion of just gratefulness. We have to be grateful to have this life and to work with plants and to make soil better. It runs through some of the things, ways we can screw up. And I, I didn't want to overemphasize this, but our job, we're captains, maybe, is not to screw things up. Understanding what herbicides do to soil life is screwing things up. Relying on excessive tillage is screwing things up. Um, clear cutting in the forest is screwing things up. What I wanted to focus on was, well, what are the fungal things that we can do? How can we abet this connection? How can we make fungal diversity the rule and restore those planetary norms? And ending again, kind of back with spirit, honoring the earth, this blessing. You know, Aldo Leopold um, put out this idea of a land ethic. And in the land ethic, he said, we humans have to really understand we're not like the ones, we're merely a member of a community and we need to respect all the members of our community. Restoring those degraded lands, you know, we talked about fungal inoculum. Um, it takes time. Connections are made in the first season. This, this is a, some research done on grazing over the course of three years and how you could restore more biological diversity by rotating the grazing and et cetera. Um, but the connections take time to build. Bill Mollison, uh, who's basically established the whole permaculture approach, spoke about how we really need to give the next generation a chance, how we need to restore rivers, we need to restore soils. You know, there is so much work to be done, and that message really resonates, you know, that's, that motivates me to come out. You know, three weeks ago I was in Australia and thinking, what am I doing now, talking to avocado growers? But it's because that's what we need to do. We need to all understand how to do it and encourage each other and figure it out societally. Let's just talk a little bit about some farm scale fungal things. Just starting with this picture. I gotta get to Hawaii and see how they grow taro root because <laughs> looking at plants like that just blow me away. Um, but one of the really practical things you're hearing some of here is this idea of cover crop cocktails. You know, th this is um, in my sweet corn. When the plants are about 12 inches high, I'll plant a mix of some clovers and forage, chicory and oats and it, it varies, but I'm establishing plants so I can enhance the community aspect for the corn, which is mycorrhizal. But they're also shading that inner row, somewhat shading at the base of the plants, so it doesn't become a weed scenario. Last year I spoke at the Acres Conference, and some of you probably have heard Christine Jones before. She's a soil ecologist from Australia. And Christine was talking about the idea of quorum sensing in a plant in a microbial community. And it, it works like this. There was some research done, I'm not sure if it was done in Canada or in the Dakotas, with plantings of triticale, which is a wheat rye hybrid cross. And this happened to be a very dry summer. And the triticale grown by itself, that was the only plant, looked like it was 
growing in a very dry summer. It was going nowhere. They had interplanted with various cover crop species, and I'm not sure what they were, but the plantings, the blocks with one or two or three or four cover crops also looked like they weren't going anywhere. The plantings with five, six, seven different species of plants, the same thing with an eighth species of plant added to the mix. It looked as vibrant and green as if it was being irrigated. And what's happening there is there's enough diversity in the plant community to support a radical diversity in the microbe community, not just fungally, but bacterially as well. And that's what the idea of quorum sensing is. Going back to that definition, fungus root, it takes two to tangle. You can have spores that are waiting for the next growing season in the ground, but unless the plants are there to photosynthesize, you don't get carbon fixing. So one of the, one of the biggest sins of industrial agriculture, and I don't mean if, yeah, one of the biggest sins of industrial agriculture is the notion of leaving ground bare for six or more months, six or so months. And that's because a cover crop could be in that ground, photosynthesizing, working with fungi, putting more carbon in the soil. We're taking this incredible engine, this incredible creation, and not utilizing it so often. And we need to learn how. You know, one of my favorite cover crops in the fall, and this is kind of the basis of what I call biological tillage, is a mix of oats and field peas and tillage radish. So the oats, there's a lot of mass and they're growing lots of roots. The field peas are adding an aspect of fixing nitrogen and the tillage radish is growing this big root that's basically breaking up soil compaction. Now tillage radish is, not, is a brassica, so it doesn't have a mycorrhizal connection, but the other two do. But all three plants winter kill. And so the snow melts and there I have this like incredible dead mulch on top of soil that the roots have broken up the compaction to some extent and I can put transplants into, maintain the mulch and this beautiful system is working with the plants and with the fungi and I really maximized how long I was doing good things in that piece of ground. And you here at this conference in particular, you know, the, what are the ramifications for us when we have plants with robust plant metabolism going all the way to produce those resistance metabolites? You know, I like to see a, a hole here or there in the kale or the arugula. Sometimes it's more holes than I want, but uh, I like to see it because I know those plants experienced environmental reality. An, an apple, when I look at a bushel of apples, and there's some apples with a spot here or there, it's, it doesn't kill you. It, it's actually like a free serving of gourmet fungus. You know, you have to start thinking about it differently. But I know that all the apples that came out of that, off that tree and in that orchard experienced environmental reality. And so there's more goodness for us. Rachel Carson talked about finding reserves of strength. You know, go back to that message of Bill Mollison, giving the next generation a chance. I am so fired up about what I call the fungal revolution and getting people to understand this connection between fungus and plants that began 450 million years ago. We need to just become a part of that. We need to do more and more fungal things. I ended the new book I, I called the last chapter Soil Redemption Song. And, and, and that has a lot to do with me and my apple path and, and picking apples on a migrant hippie crew in Vermont in the 1980s and the Jamaicans were there and so I was introduced to reggae and Bob Marley has the redemption song. So right now I just told you what I'm totally humming as I'm typing. <laughs> um, but what we've talked about here, um, the fungus and the root, the fact that we can see it now because of microscopic pictures in ways that we never could. That's who sings the redemption song for the earth, for the planet. Um, they always have and they always will. So we have 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so for questions. Let's do that. It's 
So you're talking about groundwater moisture being distributed through the fungal network. Yeah, where it's not available in the other ways to do the fungal network. Right, because some parts of the ground are drier and etc. You know, this is another way of understanding this. Um, I gave you the root vision. I'll do my incredible transformation now. I'm an apple tree. And, and if, if your thing is dwarf rootstock or seedling rootstock, I don't care. I can be the kind of apple tree you want me to be in terms of size. But I'm an apple tree, and you're seeing my canopy right now. And my root zone, so canopy, the edge of it, is called the drip line. My root zone extends maybe two and a half times from what you can see above the ground. So if I was this dwarf tree, it doesn't, it's not as big as that. But in the ground, my roots, they access only about 3% of that soil volume. I need that mycelium around my roots to get the full value of where I am. You know, my shopping district, 3% of that basically small area, that's not that much. But now I have all you, you're my friends, <laughs> and your passage plants, and your bridge trees, and, and we're moving that water. And that's, again, it's just like, start to think that way, because you can create so much more diversity with what you're doing. So measuring, doing a biological assay, so the soil food web had a soil food web test, which is basically taking a living soil with root fragments and looking through a microscope and kind of sensing counts of bacteria versus fungi. And on those tests, you will get a uh, ratio of fungal biomass to bacterial biomass. They are not identifying specific species in that. And that's OK. You know, this is not a test I ever chose to do. I, I just like fungal foods and the healthier plants. And that's kind of my way of sensing that. Now, in Australia, there's a lab that's doing DNA testing and telling you specifically what fungi are in your soil sample that you provided. Um, And that's kind of where we're at with that. I mean, it's, again, you know what good, good tilth looks like when you work with soil for a long time. It smells sweet and rich. And that's a result of fungal activity. You know, in, in the same vein, there's this habit of let's divide, because we're humans, let's divide those orchardist people, those ones with woodsy perennials. They need a fungal-dominated ecosystem, but uh, I'm an annual market gardener. I'm growing vegetables. I need a bacterial-dominated ecosystem. Wrong. 95% of the plants have a fungal <laughs> desire for this fungal connection. You need to learn how to garden more fungally. You know, less tillage is part of that. Fallows with cover crops is part of that. Um, the compost piece, never overlook the compost piece. I, I have a broad fork, you know, when I stopped the tillage. That's great for me. I don't belong to like a fitness club. I just go out and broad fork. Um, but I'm moving chunks of soil to mix compost down into there, to, to loosen things up, to break compaction. I'm not breaking up, pulverizing the whole mass of mycelium. There's ways to go about it. Just learning that if you start your own seedlings, you want those tomatoes and those onions. I actually start corn in flats because I'm so far north and the soils are cold. But my corn is fungal connection within two, three weeks. That's about the amount of time it takes for a spore to germinate and form that affiliation with the root. There's much you can do to improve your garden by thinking fungally.
So a little more in depth on concepts of tillage and cover crops. Um, I still will get out my tiller. When I do till, I kind of think of it as every two to three years is how I get back to being able to do certain things with that ground. But, but when I do that biological tillage, the, the fall plants at winter kill, you know, I'm definitely tying into the fact that these incredible plants die back, and I can count on that, which is different than rye and vetch. Um, I can plant, rake things back and plant potatoes and still hill potatoes in that. So th there's a follow-up to the choice of cover cropping. When I grow things like rye and vetch, uh, which is a great combination, an incredible root mass, and the fungi really thrive <coughs> on that, the rye plant. I don't have a crimper, so I don't get into crimping the tall plants, but I, I also have learned that when the rye starts to go to seed and the vetch is flowering, the plant has a lot less reserves. It's committed to the seed stage. And so I cut that with a, I have a flail mower on my BCS. Um, this is the, in my case, the market garden for medicinal herbs. And I'm not necessarily looking to grow a crop in that rye and vetch, because this is happening probably like mid to late June and it's getting a little late for that. But my goal then is to reseed that with oats. So I'm giving this piece of ground a whole year off. And often a cereal grain, if there's enough organic matter, is going to sprout on the surface. Some cover crops really need to be tucked in there. I don't have a seed drill in my scale. Um, so depending on where I am in the year and the timing of it, I might decide, well, I'm going to shallow till the top inch to get these seeds in, but I'm not going to till the four or five, six inches. Um, so I'm always trying to do the best I can, but sometimes I don't do the ultimate, but it, I make it work. Yeah, and, and then you'll also learn how the fungi... Oh, here's, here's a powerful cover crop. Sedan, grass, sorghum has more than 50 noted affiliations with fungi. So when I take an area out and plant sedan grass, <clears throat> which is sensitive to frost, when it gets to be about a foot and a half, maybe two feet high, I go in and rough chop it. Now that could be with a sigh, but I, I, I cut it down. And what that does is sorghum grass plants will tiller, so they send their new growth out from the base of the plant. And in, in asking the top to regrow itself, the roots will go double the depth they would have gone if you hadn't done that intermediate step of cutting. And that means that the fungi, in turn, go deeper. And so it isn't a fungal realm just in the four, six, eight inches. As you start to do these practices and you're growing things like rye, which have really deep roots and cycling some of that, and now we're talking about annual ground, you're getting fungal dynamic deeper and deeper. You're getting carbon stored deeper, humus reserves made deeper. And that's how you get into like the building of the Great Plains soils. I mean, they're, they're, the buffalo were coming and cutting the plants, so they tillered. And then they roamed far afield, and you know, that ties into rotational grazing and Allen savory and all that work. But, but that's the kind of thing that starts happening when you let the fungus do their magic, because you understand how the different plants you can work with have different gifts. So activating cool soils in the spring, um, in my orchard look view of the world, when spring comes and buds are swelling and green growth is just beginning, I do my first holistic spray. And that is a spray that I apply to the branch structure and the buds, but just as much to the ground. And, and, and my goal is twofold. One, 
I am helping enhance decomposition because a holistic spray includes biology of leaves where disease might come from. But the part that's relevant to your question is those seed oils, those fatty acids. There is no better or more exciting food for fungi, both saprotrophic and mycorrhizae, to kind of kick into gear. And, and I think of that aspect as a pulsing agent. I'm, I'm, I'm telling the biology, we're getting going again. Here's something you'll really like. Let's do it. Go ahead. Do I harvest mushrooms to get the spores out there? So, yeah, sometimes I've thrown like the butts from certain bolites or <laughs> mushrooms I found in the forest and we ate and we didn't eat all of it and I throw it out with birch trees, but I don't know that I may be gone before something happens as a result of that. I mostly spoke about the notion of going to a healthy wild ecosystem and that the soil around roots is gonna have really useful species for you to work with. I can't see those spores, there's no mushroom at that level. Um, that would be probably the soil that I would inoculate that grass in a bag if I wanted to grow the 100 million spores in a bag. So I'm, I'm doing variations on that theme, but there's distinctions to be made. Um, yeah, question. So if, if I was trying to create riparian diversity like in a wetland type area and on the banks, um, you know, this whole question of to inoculate or not to inoculate keys to how degraded is the ground that is there? Is there much of a plant community that is there? So if, if there were no real blueberries, I would definitely want to have, be planting blueberries that probably had a nursery potting stage with peat moss or add some peat moss because that's the source of that. Um, there are probably fungal species there. But you can really jumpstart things. Endo moves slowly. And uh, so you really have to evaluate how degraded is that ground in terms of making that investment. If I plant a fruit tree, it's just a no-brainer to spend three cents worth of mycorrhizal inoculum to, to have that there to start that fungal ecosystem. When I plant potatoes, cut up the eyes, lay them out in the row, I go and I throw some inoculum there because it's just a moment. When I plant garlic and I break the cloves apart and I have the pan, I sprinkle that with inoculum and every time I take out a clove, spores, several hundred spores are on my fingers. It's just so easy to do. Um, when you mix potting soil to include some inoculum, you know, so on the potting soil one, there's a white bag product from Premier and it, it says mycorrhizae on, on that bag. Has anyone worked with that or seen it? That's not what you want. That's the iridesis. It's only one species. Those are the kinds of questions you have to look at when you're thinking, I want to make this investment. Is it worthwhile? It touches on my question. It was about the production of diversity using commercial products. That's sort of when you're surprised by the ethics of commercial products of mycorrhizae in a bag. So. My take on that question of commercial inoculum introducing species that are there or not is this. A lot of these species exist in multiple ecosystems. If it's not the right species, you know, not every plant accepts every fungus, so that dynamic's in place, well then it, it just dissipates, or maybe it's there for the beginning stage. But one of the things that happens with clonally re reproduced fungi, the endomycorrhizae, is they're in an arid place. They take on a skill set that's helpful in that place. Um, when you introduce, let's say, that arid sourced fungi with your indigenous fungi, which let's say it's mossae or aggregatum, because it's very likely the core four are in your ecosystem now. It's just it's a question of how much is there enough. 
But when you introduce them, because they're the same species, they anastomize. And the skill set is now shared with the native fungi. So I, I think that that's a worry that can be overdone. Now, on the other hand, when you go and you bring a plant like, say, eucalyptus from Australia, and in the soil are those fungal spores that help eucalyptus, that's not necessarily good for the native forests in California. <laughs> so there are instances where I'd say, let's look at that. But when I talk about kind of this general approach, that's what's going on, and I think it's a good thing. One last question. Okay, I understand it's in the idea form, and it might be happening commercially, but let's just step back. What's embedded in that cardboard box is going to be the spores of sapotrophic fungi, because our bodies is not, are not plants with roots. So it's, it's not mycorrhizal in that sense. But now, let me tell you about Roger Williams, first governor of Massachusetts, Connecticut, or Rhode Island. Some, okay. <laughs> Let me see, this is a long time since I thought about this. <laughs> um, Roger Williams was buried, wherever he was buried, and it was an apple tree was growing nearby. And some decades later, for whatever reason, the, they wanted to move his body to another place. And when they dug it up, his body had been totally consumed and the roots of the apple tree, you could see a skeleton formed in the roots. They just followed the bones <laughs> to suck up the calcium. That's a good ending. I've never had that ending. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>